Great, as always, to see you, to be up here, deliver the word. It's a great honor and privilege. Please, uh, if you would, take your outline out of your program so you can follow along with the message this morning. If you're online, we welcome you to our service as well. And if you are blessed by this service, don't forget to hit that like button. That, that helps us out, helps spread the word. How many have seen the movie The Lion King? Yeah, the 1994 animated version. There is a scene in that movie when uh, the lion cub, Simba, sneaks out, brings his girlfriend with him to uh, a, a dangerous place, a dangerous uh, elephant graveyard. He's been warned against going to that place, but he goes anyway. And before he knows it, he's cornered and about to be devoured by three vicious hyenas. But Simba is bold, he's brash, he's too big for his britches. He doesn't realize the grave danger that he is in, and so he makes his best attempt to scare the hyenas away with a, with a growl, with a roar. But it doesn't amount to much. In fact, the hyenas are are breaking up in, in laughter, mocking him because it was just a little squeak. And uh, as a result, uh, Simba is still undaunted. He, he doesn't get the message. And so he opens his mouth again. And this time, a deep blaring, ferocious roar thunders out and the hyenas are startled and they, they quiver into a pile of scaredy cats. How so? Because now behind Simba is his dad. Mufasa, the Lion King. Now it's not the hyenas against Simba, it's the hyenas against Mufasa, who's fighting for his son. Mufasa makes quick work of these hyenas, pinning them down, scolding them, warning them never to get near his son again, and he sends them off scurrying and yelping for the cowards they are. Simba has been rescued, but not by his own strength, but by his father's. Well, you'll probably never be surrounded by a pack of hungry hyenas, at least I hope not. But chances are you know what it's like to be encircled by threatening circumstances threatening people. Maybe anxiety or depression. Maybe there's a, a marital issue in your life. Maybe there's a family situation or a health condition that's got you cornered. You're frightened. The odds are way against you seems impossible. You need your own Mufasa moment. Well, that's the title of today's message. Today is part two in our series, Learning from Leaders, both good and bad. It's a series in the Old Testament book of Judges. And... It's all about the leaders of Israel about 1,300 years before the birth 
of Jesus Christ. And yet, even though it's such a long time ago, it is so relevant to us today. As we learned last week, our key verse is chapter 17, verse 6. Help me out when we come to this part. It says, in those days, Israel had no king. All the people did whatever seemed right in their own eyes. No king. None whatsoever. And it's, it's, it's not just talking about a human king. The point here is, they had abandoned their true king, the one God of Israel, the Lord God Almighty. They had made up their own rules, their own religion. Last Sunday, we learned that the judges in the book of Judges were mainly military leaders, not so much adjudicating cases, but they were sent to deliver the Israelites when they got in trouble, and they had their hands full. When the book of Judges opens, Israel has conquered and occupied quite a bit of the promised land. You see this map here of the land of promise, the land of Canaan, the land of Israel, and the areas here in pink are the ones that had been occupied by the Israelites. Now, this didn't mean that they had conquered every city, but they were in control of this area. And the white, well, they, that, they had still had to conquer that yet. So there was still much to do. We also saw, sadly, that it took only three generations three generations for Israel to go from Gen A that served the Lord with great passion out of a personal relationship with him, with fervor, with faith, with obedience to Gen B that still did the right things but they were serving more out of ritual, out of religion to Gen C, who has no relationship with God and is instead lured into the Canaanite lifestyle. Idol worship, violence, child sacrifice, sexual perversion. In the book of Judges, Israel takes a deep dive into debauchery. Now, don't forget, Israel is in this covenant relationship with Yahweh God. That means they have vowed their, their lives to him, and he has vowed himself to them. It's very much like a, a marriage relationship. They need to be faithful. And yet, she's been cheating on him. She's a, a, a serial cheater on God. Now, this is vital. In the book of Judges, we encounter what's called the, the Judges' vicious cycle. And we're going to read about it and then talk about it a little bit more. Judges chapter 2, verses 11 through 19. It says... The Israelites did evil in the Lord's sight and served the images of Baal. They abandoned the Lord. These instances of Lord should be in all caps. There was some sort of a computer glitch there. Uh, L-O-R-D, Lord, meaning Yahweh. They abandoned Yahweh, the God of their ancestors, who had brought them out of Egypt. They went after other gods, worshiping the gods of the people around them. And they angered Yahweh. They abandoned Yahweh to serve Baal and the images of Ashtoreth. That was a fertility goddess. Verse 14, this made the Lord burn with anger against Israel. 
So he handed them over to the raiders who stole their possessions. He turned them over to their enemies all around, and they were no longer able to resist them. Now, it's important to note that the Lord, when he made this covenant with Israel that they freely entered into, he warned them, if you cheat on me and go after other gods, this is going to happen. And so he's fulfilling his promise here. Verse 15, every time Israel went out to battle, the Lord fought against them, causing them to be defeated just as he had warned back when he made the covenant. And the people were in great distress. Then the Lord raised up judges to rescue the Israelites from their attackers. Whenever the Lord raised up a judge over Israel, he was with that judge and rescued the people from their enemies throughout the judge's lifetime. For the Lord took pity on his people who were burdened by oppression and suffering. But when the judge died, the people returned to their corrupt ways, behaving worse than those who had lived before them. They went after other gods, serving and worshiping them. And they refused to give up their evil practices and stubborn ways. That's the word of the Lord. And what a sad, sad word it is. Now the cycle you see on the screen provides us a visual of what I just read to you from Judges. And it's also there on your outline. And you can fill in the blanks as we go along. You see that we have four, or actually five, S's up here. And we're going to fill them in. The first has already been filled in. That's sin. That's when the Israelites worship idols, depart from the Lord. They sin against him. They cheat on him. Then the second S is servitude. And this is when God sends other nations to enslave the Israelites. Servitude. And then the third is uh, uh, two words, sorrow and supplication. So Israel, of course, is sorry for what they did, sorry, 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 and they cry out to the Lord for help. That's, that is, they, they supplicate, they, they ask, they petition the Lord for help. And because God is so tender-hearted and loves them, he raises up a judge a judge who rescues Israel from the foreign nation. And Israel experiences a Mufasa moment and once again enjoys peace and safety. And that is number four, salvation. God sends a judge to save and rescue Israel. But this is called a cycle for a reason. Once the hyenas are scared off, why, the Israelites backslide into their old ways, and guess what? The cycle repeats itself. And this is what goes on through the book of Judges. Sin, servitude, sorrow and supplication, and salvation. Can you relate to this cycle in your own life? your walk with the Lord, you fall into sin, a habit, maybe losing your temper, maybe that's your, your weakness, or gossiping, or looking at pornography, or exaggerating, which is really just lying, stretching the truth, or you're squandering your time, way overdoing leisure time and, and, and neglecting the Word of God, neglecting prayer, neglecting fellowship, neglecting service. Or whatever it is, you give in to it, you indulge. And worse yet, you excuse yourself 
Well, I've had a hard day. Well, it's this or that. You rationalize it. You don't repent. You let it slide. You ignore it. And you keep it up. But then, the temperature of your relationship with the Lord drops like a rock below zero. Soon, the Lord brings trials into your life. Maybe it's an illness. Maybe it's a job loss or depression or anxiety or some other hardship. Now, I want to be clear on this. I am not saying that every time a hardship arises in your life that God is punishing you. No, do not conclude that. Let's say a, a friend of yours has, is diagnosed with, with cancer or some other hardship. It is, it's not our place to assume that God is punishing that person or disciplining that person. That is not our call. That's between that person and the Lord. Our duty is to show compassion, to help that person, and when it's appropriate, to share godly counsel. But the goal is always to restore, never to destroy. But when the hardship happens to you or to me, we, we can ask, we should ask, we must ask, Lord, what are you telling me here? Have I sinned in some way? Is this your discipline in my life? If so, show me. Show me clearly how I have sinned. Open my eyes to the truth, however much I may want or try to deny it. Convict me. Soften my heart. Grant me wholehearted repentance. Forgive me. Restore me, Lord. Deliver me, Lord. Grant me peace once again. And then... You can say to the Lord, but, but, but Father, if this trial is not discipline, if I'm not being chastised for something, then may I not wallow in guilt or fear or condemnation, but may I accept this, this trial as a teaching tool that you have brought into my life you are using in my life that I may learn from it and benefit from it no matter how long it takes. Do what you need to do. May this trial have its full effect in my life and if it's your will to deliver me, Lord, please do so as soon as possible. I trust in you. Do so to the glory of your name. Today, we're looking at only the first half of this teaching on the Mufasa moment. Next Sunday, Lord willing, we will study the, uh, the second half. But the first half is the foundation of the second. And it's all wrapped up in our main idea. The one thing you want to remember if you forget everything else, it goes like this. Only real repentance brings lasting rescue. Real repentance, lasting rescue. I'm a diabetic, type 2, have been for many, many years. I'll never forget uh, one time, this is many years ago, I... I went in to the doctor for a checkup to see how my diabetes numbers were coming along, and my doctor comes in and he says, Mr. Ream, your, your test results, your numbers, they are lousy. You're going to damage your organs. This is not good. Your sugar is way high. He said, I, I've got you on the most powerful medication short of putting you on 
insulin. Now, this was years ago. I didn't know anything about insulin pumps or monitors, that, that sort of thing, automatic stuff like that. The thought of having to inject myself every day with a hypodermic needle, well, that was not a very pleasant thought. And the doctor must have recognized it on, the, on my face uh, that I had pooped my pants <laughs> when he said this. So he, he paused and he says, you know, I, I can see this is, this is distressing to you. Okay, we'll, we'll give the medication another try. But if you do not start eating better, if you don't start exercising more, then it's insulin for you, buddy. And so I, I went out from that uh, appointment thinking, oh man, I gotta really bear down. I've gotta improve my diet. No more of this binge snacking in the evening. I gotta get out there, pound the pavement at least five times a week and exercise, and I did, and it helped, and my numbers went down for a while. <laughs> well, it's a, it's a weakness of mine. It, it's, a, it's a vicious cycle. I do well for a while, and then I just kind of creep back into my old ways. But this time, since my last appointment a couple few weeks ago, this time I'm going to do it right, okay? <laughs> All right. Uh, maybe you can relate in, in that or some other sphere of your life. For Israel, it was very, very serious. It was more serious than, than junk food. They, they kept spiraling through this sin cycle, generation after generation, until we come to chapter 10, verse 6. We pick up, there, it says, again, the Israelites did evil in the Lord's sight. They served the images of Baal and Ashtoreth and the gods of Aram and Sidon and Moab and Ammon and Philistia. They abandoned the Lord and no longer served him at all. So the Lord burned with anger against Israel and he turned them over to the Philistines. They're the enemies to the, to the west down in the southwest uh, where Gaza, Gaza is today. In fact, the city was back then called Gaza, one of the Philistine cities. And the Ammonites, they're in the east, so the east and the west, who began to oppress them that year, it says. The Israelites were in great distress. Finally, they cried out to the Lord for help, saying, we have sinned against you because we have abandoned you as our God and have served the images of Baal. The Lord replied, Did not I rescue you from the Egyptians, the Amorites, the Ammonites, the Philistines, the Sidonians, the Amalekites, and the Mayanites? When they oppressed you, you cried out to me for help, and I rescued you. Yet you have abandoned me and served other gods, so I will not rescue you anymore. Go and cry out to the gods you have chosen. Let them rescue you in your hour of distress. Whew. This is even tougher than the passage we read earlier. Their repentance was only half-hearted. They wanted relief, but not remedy. Real repentance is the only remedy that brings lasting relief. And hear me on this. It's not about just trying harder. As we'll see, especially next Sunday, God must intervene. Mufasa has to show up. And do what you can't do. Fight the battle that you yourself cannot win. But you do play a very important role. 
Repentance, that's, that's our part. Repentance must be genuine from the heart. And you need accountability. You need the church to rally around you or uh, close friends in your small group or whatever it might be, maybe a, an accountability partner or a mentor to help you, to pray with you, to stand by you, to ask you the tough questions. Many years ago, I read a book by a psychiatrist. This is uh, back in the early 90s. Psychiatrist by the name of Dr. John White. The book was called Changing on the Inside. And he, he describes in this book, it's a great book, after working for decades with people having all sorts of problems, addictions, deeply seated problems and perversions and so forth, he concluded that lasting change is impossible using, the convention, using only the conventional methods of psychology. He said the only real hope is for what he called an earthquake of the soul. This is a shaking so deep and profound that everything in your life, below the surface, above the surface, on the surface, is shaken. It's altered profoundly as a result of the earthquake. God may use a heart attack. That's how he brought my, my dad to the Lord. It was through a heart attack. That was the earthquake of his soul. Or maybe it's a near-death experience or the loss of a loved one. It rattles you, rattles you to the core. And it changes your whole perspective on life. Now, of course, trauma can be very harmful to a person. It can wreck your life. We've seen that before with people. But this kind of earthquake brings about positive change. When I read White's book, I, I said, my golly, he's, he's describing what the Bible calls repentance. Genuine repentance. Have you ever experienced an earthquake of the soul? If you have, you, you never recover from it. It stays with you for the rest of your life in a good way. I've had it happen a couple few times in, in my life. The most dramatic was back in January, January 12, 1973. Oh, God was so merciful to me. That's the day I came to know Christ as my Lord and Savior. I bowed the knee and found him, and he transformed me. And he rocked my life. I've never been the same since then. Now, what about the Israelites? What ended up happening with them there in chapter 10? Did God rescue them again? Did Mufasa show up? Scare off the hyenas? Well, let's look. We pick up in chapter 10, verse 15. But the Israelites pleaded with the Lord. Remember, he just said, forget it. You go run off to your, your other gods. But the Israelites pleaded with the Lord and said, we have sinned. Punish us as you see fit. Only rescue us today from our enemies. Then the Israelites put aside their foreign gods and served the Lord. And he was grieved by their misery. <clears throat> you know, when I read this, <clears throat> I, I, I think about how many times they have cried wolf and the cynic in me asks, is this the real deal? Anybody else think that when you, when you read this? 
real repentance. Is that what's going on here, or is this just alligator tears? Are they, are they just saying what they know God wants to hear so that they can get off the hook once again? Or on the other hand, I mean, there are some real positive things going on here. They, they, they admit that they've sinned. That's crucial with genuine repentance. Punish us as you see fit. They're not saying, oh, no, I don't deserve it, I don't deserve it. Yeah, we, we deserve this. And then it says they, they put away their foreign gods and served the Lord. Well, that seems like what it takes for genuine repentance. And so the result, God is grieved by their misery. And as the story moves on, he once again rescues them. And yet, when you keep reading the book of Judges, you see that eventually they go back to their wily ways and repeat the cycle. And so what's up? Well, perhaps the repentance was phony. But my tendency is to think that some of it may have really been genuine in some people's cases. And in others, it was just, you know, to get their feet out of the fire. It wasn't a genuine earthquake. It wasn't love for God. It was just hatred for the punishment. And I think what this shows us is a very important lesson. It's God's heart. He so wants to forgive us. He so wants to restore us. He'll, he'll take the, the faintest glimmer of repentance. You know, repentance does have to be genuine, but it doesn't have to be perfect. God wants to restore. Yes, the idols must go. The cheating has to end. But God loves to rescue and forgive and deliver and restore. We see this most clearly in the cross of Jesus Christ. God the Son becomes man in Jesus, lives a sinless life. Why? Because he loves you and he wants to save you. And so he dies on the cross in your place, suffers for your sins so you don't have to take the penalty. And he's buried and he rises from the dead so that we could receive salvation through trusting in him, forgiveness of all our sins. And now he, he's calling, he's calling our nation to repentance. He's calling the church to repentance, calling me to repentance and you every day to humble ourselves before him and walk in newness of life. Many people in this room have experienced the earthquake of the soul. You know what I'm talking about. It's happened to you. <clears throat> in my life, I've, I've experienced that initial earthquake and many aftershocks of that first earthquake. But if you need that earthquake of the soul today, then cry out to the Lord. The moment God shows up, he will bring rescue. It may not be in the way you think of it. Some of these judges were great. Some of them were mediocre, and some of them were scoundrels. The Lord uses all kinds of means. We'll see that next week. But whatever the case, we, it, the healing comes when we turn to him. I love this verse in Jeremiah, chapter 29, 
verses 12 through 14. The Lord is speaking. He says, Then you will call on me and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord. Have you experienced that initial earthquake of the soul that transformed you from lost to found? If not, the Lord is calling you. He's calling you to repentance today. Some of the the aftershocks in in my life since that initial earthquake have upended my life and, and, and jarred my teeth loose, as it were. Crawling out from under the rubble was excruciating, but the Lord was behind this. He was quaking, quaking my life. And when I got up out of the debris and cleaned up and the Lord helped me rebuild the ruins of my life, it was better. I was stronger for him. I was closer to the Lord. I was better equipped to serve him. Now I thank God for those quakes in my life. If you're going through one, if you're in one right now, a tough one, cry out to the Lord. Sometimes... You can dodge a quake by repenting before it strikes. So on that bright note, why don't we stand up together and close our service. If you know you need the earthquake of the soul, the initial one, you need to come to know the Lord as your Savior. Today is your day. Come on down here and talk with one of the members of our pastoral prayer team as soon as the service closes. They'll be happy to help you, pray with you, counsel with you. Maybe there's a a need in your life. Maybe you're going through a crisis right now. And you could really benefit from somebody praying with you. Come on down. If you brought your offering... You can uh, put it in the box there in the back of the auditorium. Right now, we'll dedicate it to the Lord. Dear Heavenly Father, dear God, you love us so much. You sent us Jesus, our deliverer, our rescuer. Thank you for shaking up my life. Thank you for the, the, the earthquakes that turned me around, that got my attention, that brought me to repentance. I pray, Father, for good earthquakes in our lives to transform us, even if they're painful earthquakes, Lord. I pray for the person here today who's, who's, who's trying to cry, crawl out from under the rubble. Deliver that person. Rescue that person today. That person here who knows that he or she is not a born-again Christian, that that person would cry out and say, Jesus, I believe you died for me and rose from the dead. I believe that you are Lord. Save me. Save me. Father in heaven, we commit our tithes and offerings to you. Please use them for your honor and glory, every penny. In Jesus' name, amen.